Hey, 10,000 Commandments, Adam Smith's Moral Sentiments as an Esoteric Critique of Interventionism. The title alludes to the Ten Commandments. The first four Ten Commandments are of the nature of God is God, and don't you forget it. The fifth, honor thy mother and father, and then the next five are of the nature of thou shalt not. Steal, kill, commit adultery, bear false witness, or covet thy neighbor's goods. So the last five have the flavor of simple justice or commutative justice, not messing with other people's stuff. Smith uses the expression abstaining from what is another's. And he uses that expression in the important paragraph where he uses the term commutative justice commutative justice to distinguish it from other dimensions or facets of justice, other facets which I think uh, are worth retaining. So I continue to use this modifier, commutative, not messing with other people's stuff. Now the duties of the Ten Commandments are only certain simple duties. Um, we have many duties in life such as should I put a blanket on my horse? And this one equestrian program developed this quite elaborate uh, guide or flow chart to decide whether to put a blanket on your horse. And you can see how many considerations they have uh, in play here and how loose and vague these considerations must be in practice. You can imagine an authority such as a religion or a government proposing to set up rules, explicit rules for this matter, <clears throat> and proposing to even police those rules. You can imagine how silly that would be, but that's what governments do. As Wayne Cruz of the Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, uh, shows every year in his report, 10,000 Commandments. That's where this expression comes from. I love this title because of the way it mixes uh, the idea of religious duties and religious rules with the government rules. Turns out 10,000 is a vast understatement. There's some 175,000 pages, dense pages, of the Code of Federal Regulations, so there's a lot more than 10,000, in fact. This kind of rulemaking, I think, uh, was very much against the spirit of Adam Smith. Um, that's quite clear, I'd say, in The Wealth of Nations. I want to suggest that it's also um, the case with the theory of moral sentiments, which um, officially is about how we judge morally of the conduct first of our neighbors and afterwards of ourselves. Okay, so it seems to be a focus on the equal-equal relationship, you among your neighbors you and your voluntary affairs within the rules of commutative justice uh, with your neighbors, with your church members, with your workmates, with your employer, with your employees. He does in the book speak some directly to the other kind of relationship, the superior-inferior relationship, the governor and the governed relationship. But I think that he is treating this second relationship more than he makes clear, more than first meets the eye. So I want to suggest that there's esoteric writing in Smith. The concept of esotericism and the distinction between eso and exoteric goes back a long ways. This is from the 1750s, the encyclopedia edited by Diderot, uh, and the entry starts, the first of these words, exoteric, signifies exterior, the second interior. The ancient philosophers had a double doctrine, the one external, public, or exoteric, the other internal, secret, or esoteric. There's a great deal of discussion in the 18th century about esoteric writing. Condorcet uh, spoke of certain thinkers in England and France covering the truth with a veil to spare eyes too weak and leaving others the pleasure of divining it and seeming not to want more than a semi-tolerance in religion and a semi-liberty in politics. 
the flavor of my talk is that <clears throat> I think Smith toned down his pro-liberty talk explicitly um, and that in a sense he was even stronger for liberty than uh, he let on. Esotericism may be associated with uh, Leo Strauss, but I draw rather on this 2014 book, Philosophy Between the Lines, The Lost History of Esoteric Writing by Arthur Meltzer. Uh, I think this is a quite extraordinary book. The book shows that esotericism was widely practiced and acknowledged and that uh, in the 18th century in particular, people debated its worthiness. But around 1800, it declined sharply and we have lost awareness of it. The book explains four purposes of esotericism and it provides a beginner's guide to esoteric reading. One of the many techniques and devices discussed in the beginner's guide is called dissembling the true target. The author seems to be talking about why, but between the lines, as it were, he's really talking about Z. So Z is the true target, which is being dissembled by apparently talking about why. And I'm going to treat three moments in TMS, which I purport are cases of Smith dissembling the true target. The first comes from part five of the book of the influence of custom and fashion, the influence of those on our moral sentiments. It's 18 pages long and it's quite, it's really quite strange and meandering as you read it. And then finally, <clears throat> it comes here just two pages before the end to what I take to be the main point, an issue of the whole part. Can custom and fashion deeply pervert moral sentiments? And Smith's answer, which he gives here, but I think is kind of tacit throughout the whole part, Smith's answer is that deep perversion cannot infect the general style and character, I'm sorry, style of character and behavior in life among equals in society. But the greatest perversions can occur in particular usages. That is to say, there can be particular practices and institutions which greatly pervert our moral sentiments. And he goes into an example. He, he brings up this question here, and down here he goes into his chief example at the end, infanticide which is exposing and leaving to die children as practiced uh, in ancient Greece that he discusses here. <clears throat> and then he comes finally to this final paragraph, which is a very natural selection paragraph, one of the most natural selection moments in Smith's writings. After talking about in infanticide, he says, there is an obvious reason why custom should never pervert our sentiments with regard to the general style and character of conduct and behavior. No society could subsist a moment in which the usual strain of men's conduct and behavior was of a piece with the horrible practice I have just now mentioned. So this paragraph is saying <clears throat> that the basic formulation of commutative justice among equals is almost a natural convention in societies for natural selection reasons. If um, <clears throat> people were messing with each other's stuff, that community, that society wouldn't prosper. It wouldn't survive. So this general formulation, not messing with other people's stuff among equals, um, is sort of naturally selected. Let me say, though, that the ex exact terms of what is messing, what makes something other people's, and what even is stuff, like what counts as something that's protected by these kind of rules, are historically dependent. So there's a historical dimension in this general formulation. But that said, whatever it happens to be in the societies uh, we might be talking about, there's this general tendency, Smith says, for gross perversions not to infect the general <clears throat> style of character and behavior. 
Now, a few pages earlier in the part, he talks about how refined societies excel in the soft, amiable, and humane virtues, while rude and uncivilized societies excel in the awesome, respectable virtues of self-command. And um, <clears throat> this is a distinction, these two sets of virtues, the amiable and the respectable, that um, he has um, discussed and uh, set out as important early in the work. So he's using it here. He's saying that among rude and barbarous nations, the virtues of self-denial are more cultivated than those of humanity. He says, the savages in North America assume upon all extraordinary occasions the greatest indifference and would think themselves degraded if they should ever appear in any respect to be overcome either by love or grief or resentment. Their magnanimity and self-command in this respect are almost beyond the conception of Europeans. So in matters like love, they show very little tenderness and in great duress, they show insensibility and contempt of their adversities. So I want to go on and read um, the passage here through, kind of here, through to the end of this paragraph. <clears throat> so he elaborates on this insensibility in duress. When a savage is made prisoner of war, and receives, as is usual, the sentence of death from his conquerors. He hears it without expressing any emotion and afterwards submits to the most dreadful torments without ever bemoaning himself or discovering any other passion but contempt of his enemies. While he is hung by the shoulders of, over a slow fire, he derides his tormentors and tells them with how much more ingenuity he himself had tormented such of their countrymen as had fallen into his hands. After he has been scorched and burnt and lacerated in all the most tender and sensible parts of his body for several hours together, he is often allowed, in order to promote his misery, a short respite and is taken down from the stake. He employs this interval in talking upon all indifferent subjects, inquires after the news of the country, and seems indifferent about nothing but his own situation. Every savage is said to prepare himself for this, um, sorry, from his earliest youth for this dreadful end. He composes for this purpose what they call the song of death, a song which he is to sing when he has fallen into the hands of his enemies and is expiring under the tortures which they inflict upon him. It consists of insults upon his tormentors and expresses the greatest contempt of death and pain. He sings this song upon all extraordinary occasions when he goes out to war, when he meets his enemies in the field, or whenever he has a mind to show that he has familiarized his imagination to the most dreadful misfortune, and that no human event can daunt his resolution or alter his purpose. The same contempt of death and torture prevails among all other savage nations. There is not a Negro from the coast of Africa who does not, in this respect, possess a degree of magnanimity which the soul of his sordid master is too often scarce capable of conceiving. Fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtues neither of the countries which they come from nor of those which they go to, and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justly expose them to the contempt of the vanquished. Yeah, so <clears throat> those last two sentences are obviously about the slave trade. He meanders into that. I want to read those last two sentences again because <clears throat> you need to look at them a couple times to really appreciate them. There's not a Negro from the coast of Africa who does not, in this respect, possess a degree of magnanimity which the soul of his sordid master is too often scarce capable of conceiving. Fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtues neither of the countries which they come from 
nor of those which they go to, and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justly expose them to the contempt of the vanquished. Now, right from that paragraph, he, con he continues on with this theme about uh, this heroic and unconquerable firmness is not required of those who are brought up to live in civilized societies. Refinement softens manners. He says the French and the Italians, the two most polished nations upon the continent, um, show this. And he refers to uh, an observation by Abbot Dubois. Um, an Italian expresses more emotion on being condemned in a fine of 20 shillings than an Englishman on receiving the sentence of death. He talks about animated eloquence as one of the signs of this refinement. This animated eloquence, which has been long practiced in France and Italy, is just beginning to be introduced into England. So wide is the difference between the degrees of self-command which are required in civilized and barbarous nations. Now, <clears throat> what he's doing here, look, he's really writing mainly for a British audience, or at least an English, yeah, a British audience. Um, and he's talking now about comparisons, he's making comparisons between England and France and Italy. Um, and he's saying, you know, if you think yourself superior somehow in some manner to the French and the Italians, it's in this. It's in this self-command. It's in the respectable virtues. And you know what? <clears throat> that same way in which you feel superior to them, the heroes of the, uh, the American nations, Indian nations, and the uh, African nations are way above you. So he's precisely accentuating the superiority in a certain respect. This isn't a, a kind of the governor governs superiority, but just like a comparative superiority in certain qualities, certain virtues. Um, happening now right in his own society. So in that final sentence of the part, which I read before, no society could subsist a moment in which the usual strain of men's conduct and behavior was, as, was of a piece with the horrible practice I have just now mentioned. The one he has just now mentioned is infanticide, practiced 2,000 years ago, way down in Greece, not that relevant and pertinent to his audience. Three pages earlier, he spoke about his fellow countrymen today in Britain practicing this terrible practice uh, which deserves the contempt of those vanquished by, the, by that practice. So I, I want to suggest that the horrible practice I've just now mentioned is really about the slave trade. Those two sentences to me are the two most powerful sentences of the whole work. They just, they just ring all sorts of things. Um, and, and the way he just brings them up in a sort of indirect way, almost as a digression, um, then unloads those two sentences and then just moves on, I think only heightens their significance, really. Now, if this is so, why was Smith so indirect? That's something worth talking about and considering. There's a number of different possibilities. I won't go into it. Um, I do think that Smith's sentences probably made a difference. Um, they are quoted twice by Arthur Lee in this essay from 1764, um, and he was an anti-slavery figure. I think that piece itself, by the way, is quite esoteric. Um, I don't have direct evidence, um, it may be out there, I haven't looked that hard, that William Wilberforce and his colleagues um, in the cause against the slave trade and slavery uh, were affected by these sentences, but it's very, very reasonable to think so. We know that Wilberforce was a fan of Smith. Incidentally, there's this nice movie, Amazing Grace, about that, which you might want to check out. So that is the first of the three, dissembling the true moments. <clears throat> the next two both come from the very final section of TMS. It's only 16 pages long. It's called Of the Manner in Which Different Authors Have Treated of the Practical Rules of Morality. 
And again, practical rules it apparently is very much about the equal-equal relationship and not about the superior-inferior relationship, the practical rules of morality. <clears throat> and at the start, he says it was observed that the rules of justice are the only rules of morality which are precise and accurate, that those of all other virtues are loose, vague, and indeterminate. Now this is a very fundamental uh, distinction in Smith. Commutative justice have these, has these precise and accurate rules, which he then likens to grammar, whereas all the other virtues have loose, vague, and indeterminate rules, like the squiggly line in the picture, um, which he likens to the rules which critics lay down for what are sublime and elegant in writing you might say, like aesthetics. And it's really significant that commutative justice is the only virtue, okay, the only set of duties that are precise and accurate. This picture here shows the scheme, the parallel between the rules of morals and the rules of writing, um, grammar, uh, I'm sorry, um, grammar is also precise and accurate like commutative justice. All other virtues are loose, vague, and indeterminate. And there's, a ver there's several dimensions to the specialness of commutative justice. First, they are, the rules are precise and accurate. Second, they are only negative, only negative. And this is really in two senses. In the first sense, this statement isn't necessarily so airtight, only negative in the sense that you can obey or fulfill the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. Smith actually says, often you may fulfill. Because, I mean, if you're on the job at your workplace, you can't fulfill your rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing, right? If you borrowed 10 pounds from your neighbor and it's time to pay him back, you can't fulfill the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. So in that sense, it's actually a little, a little inexact or, 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 or inaccurate. But the more important sense of only negative is that feedback on your performance is only negative when you get feedback on how well you fulfilled the rules of commutative justice, you only get criticism for having violated it. You don't get commendation or praise for having fulfilled it. Just like with grammar, of course, beyond grammar school. Um, you know, if you turn in a term paper and your grammar is perfect, that doesn't mean you get a good grade. It doesn't even mean the teacher says anything about, you know, your, your having been so grammatical. In fact, you could turn in a blank piece of paper and the grammar would be perfect. So if with grammar, to go back to this kind of picture, it's, as, it's kind of a precise and accurate solid straight line. If you violate that, you get whacked, but if you're above that, you get no praise. Whereas the lines for the other virtues um, have a sort of middle sense of propriety and feedback can be both positive praise and negative. <clears throat> Whereas for grammar, and for commutative justice, only negative. So go back to our bullet list. Um, the rules of commutative justice may be forced, even among equals, he says. That's different than the rules of the other virtues. Commutative justice is indispensable. This echoes that paragraph from part five where he says it's a natural convention. Society can't sub, uh, survive and prosper uh, without obeying commutative justice. Commutative justice is the pillar, so it's indispensable. All of these are very special to commutative justice. And these features, particularly precise and accurate, mean that commutative justice, not messing with other people's stuff, admits of a flip side, others not messing with your stuff. The word for that is liberty. So <clears throat> I'm reviewing this because this is a very fundamental distinction in um, this last part where he says moralists have, have often failed 
to see the specialness of commutative justice. And he divides uh, the previous moralist he wants to, tr to refer to into two groups. One are those who wrote as though all the virtues, all the rules of morality were like aesthetics, okay? Were loose, vague, and indeterminate. And in this category, he puts all the ancient moralists. So Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, all the ancient moralists he's suggesting. He loves them uh, to a great extent, certainly. But um, in a sense, he is knocking them for not seeing the specialness of commutative justice and developing their discourse along those lines. <clears throat> So in that sense, since it's all the ancient moralists, there is, he is kind of saying that the awareness of the specialness of commutative justice and its flip side, liberty, is a sort of modern phenomenon. Now, the other type of past moralists are those who have treated the rules of morality as though they were precise and accurate, as though they were like grammar. So he calls them grammarians. And here he makes another dis division. Um, one group, the natural per jurisprudence writers, <clears throat> like Grotius and Pufendorf, uh, you might think of the Spanish scholastics as well, although I, he does not refer to them. Um, they properly, uh, he suggests, I'm not sure quite how accurate this suggestion is, but he says they properly confined their grammatical approach to the sort of rules and virtues that, that, that admit of that, that are susceptible to that kind of treatment, uh, like commutative justice. So this was jurisprudence. Um, he says, by observing all the rules of jurisprudence, supposing them ever so perfect, we should deserve nothing but to be free from external punishment. So it's a very commutative justice notion. If you <clears throat> observe commutative justice, people will leave you alone. But the other sort of grammarians are the casuists, or the books of casuistry, <clears throat> of the middle and later ages of the Christian church. And here he gives a little background. What seems principally to have given occasion to casuistry was the custom of auricular confession introduced by the Roman Catholic superstition in times of barbarism and ignorance. By auricular confession, the most secret actions and even the thoughts of every person, which could be suspected of receding in the smallest degree from the rules of Christian purity, were to be revealed to the confessor. The confessor informed his penitents whether and in what respect they had violated their duty and what penance it behooved them to undergo before he could absolve them in the name of the offended deity. So he's talking about the casuists here as these people who took a grammatical approach trying to make what is actually loose, vague, and indeterminate grammatical by setting up these rules for confessors to like, as it were, mete out punishment and penance um, to, to the confessors, uh, uh, you know, the people in confession. Um, and in this 16-page last section, he devotes quite a bit of space to this, to, to, well, to the casuists generally. And one of the examples he brings up to, to, to somehow illustrate what they dealt with, he says, to give a trite example, a highwayman, by fear of death, obliges a traveler to promise him a certain sum of money. So you're out on the highway and a guy stops you, a highwayman stops you and says, unless you promise to give me 10 pounds when you get back to town, I'm gonna kill you. And you promise him that. And then Smith continues, whether such a promise extorted in this manner by unjust force ought to be regarded as obligatory is a question that has been very much debated. He like just says that. And then he spends three pages talking about this highwayman thing and this promise, okay? Well, I can't go into the details and all, but the, 
my, my purported assembling the true target is that the highwayman is sort of a, a, an analog to government here. That he's actually talking about what obligations you have to government and how obligatory those promises to government uh, uh, really are for you. As it turns out, and I haven't done a lot of looking into this, but based on a little bit, I see that there's quite a tradition of political philosophers drawing parallels between highwaymen, pirates, robbers, and government, okay? Cicero and St. Augustine talk about uh, this story of Alexander capturing a pirate. How dare you molest the seas? And the pirate responds, <clears throat> how dare you molest the whole world? When I do what I do with a single ship, I'm a pirate, but when you do it with a navy, you're an emperor. And the story goes that Alexander found this response elegant and excellent. Um, but you see this in other writers, including you know, notably John Locke, right in the second treatise. Um, he's, he's saying that to think that you, know, you are obliged to deliver up to unjust conquerors what they demand is like saying that robbers and pirates have a right of empire over whomever they have force enough to master, or that men are bound by promises which unlawful force extorted from them. Unlawful force. Smith used the term unjust force. And then Locke gives his own opinion. The injury and the crime is equal, whether committed by the wearer of a crown or some petty villain, very much echoing that pirate that that uh, Alexander captured. Now Locke is talking here about an unjust government, okay? And so it's, the idea here is not, and the suggestion here by me, and I think implicitly by Smith, certainly, and it's clear in Smith's work generally as well as Hume's, that governments are not equivalent to ordinary criminals, okay? There is a difference. Um, ordinary criminals don't put up a website and say, 2 a.m. tonight I'm going to break into your car and steal all the stuff in there. They don't announce what they're going to do. Uh, it's very, very different. Governments are a sort of overt, explicit, in, in a way legitimized form of force. But the key thing here is that they are both force. And that's the importance of the parallel, as I see it. <clears throat> Smith's own conclusion, after going through these three pages about uh, the highwaymen example, you know, never mentioning government explicitly, uh, is that if the man who you know, promised 10 pounds to the highwayman um, and then doesn't keep the promise, he says his character, if not irretrievably stained and polluted, has at least a ridicule affixed to it, which it will be very difficult entirely to efface. And no man, I imagine, who had gone through an adventure of this kind would be fond of telling the story. So he's certainly not saying you have this regular moral obligation to keep your promise like any other justly rendered promise, voluntarily rendered promise. But at the same time, he's saying, you want to go along with it. You want to keep it if you can. You don't like to think that you're violating promises. And I think this reflects his general attitude about um, government I and mean, about the superior-inferior relationship, the governor-governor-governed relationship. Um, it's here. It's not going away. We've got to learn to manage it. Um, we've got to We've got to go along with it to a good extent. Um, and there's even a sort of legitimacy to it. But there's different refinements, assessments of what they do, what's more and less legitimate. We've got to establish some kind of regularity, conventions, customs, norms about how that goes on. In other words, better and worse government. Um, but the underlying important thing about the parallel is that government is the initiation of coercion. It, like the bandit, is a coercer, but
but it's not like an ordinary criminal. It's a special player. It's an exceptional player, which gives rise to this ex exceptional kind of relationship with which Hume and Smith affirm and say, we've got to accommodate our thinking such, uh, with this in it. We've got to accommodate this and build our system of thinking and political thought that recognizes both of these relationships. We shouldn't try to flatten the matters down to a single relationship among equals. Okay, well in this discussion of casuistry comes also like what I suggest is the third, dissembling the true target, and that's that the rules of casu casuistry themselves are like the 10,000 commandments, almost as though, uh, I mean, there was plenty of crazy rulemaking in his day, and uh, so he was familiar with it, but there's almost a flavor here that he foresees that this could get much worse, right? If religion is going to recede, what is going to replace religion in people's um, need for meaning and validation? And, um, you know, I think maybe he saw, for example, in the writings of Rousseau, where people might be going with that. Um, so after talking about casuistry a good deal, he finally, at the end of the casuistry uh, dis discussion, basically just unloads on it. I want to read this. Books of casuistry, therefore, are generally as useless as they are commonly tiresome. I want you to think about, you know, the Code of Federal Regulations here. None of their cases tend to animate us to what is generous and noble. None of them tend to soften us to what is gentle and humane. Many of them, on the contrary, tend rather to teach us to chicane with our own consciences and by their vain subtleties serve to authorize innumerable evasive refinements with regard to the most essential articles of our duty. That frivolous accuracy which they attempted to introduce into subjects which do not admit of it almost necessarily betrayed them into those most, those dangerous errors, that is the chicaning with our conscience and the evasion of duties, and at the same time rendered their works dry and disagreeable abounding in abstruse and metaphysical distinctions. Um, there's a lot to be said about this, what he's saying here, applying to OSHA, the FDA, occupational licensing, the 10,000 commandments. Um, and I think there's a lot to the moral dimension of this too, chicaning with our conscience Getting, leading us to believe that we're fulfilling our conscience, we're fulfilling all the virtues, not just commutative justice, but our other duties, the loose, vague, and indeterminate ones, the becoming ones, by somehow endorsing the 10,000 commandments and promoting the 10,000 commandments. He used the word innumerable in here, innumerable evasive refinements. In the wealth of nations, this whole parallel is really quite explicit. I mean, he doesn't refer to casuistry, but he does, does condemn this kind of governmental rulemaking. And when he talks about ministers superintending uh, the private affairs of citizens, he says those ministers fall prey to innumerable delusions. It's not just they don't have the local knowledge, it's that they've got delusions and innumerable ones with all these abstruse and metaphysical distinctions, which we see throughout the federal and, and, and other government regulation, these, these bureaucratic distinctions which everybody is required then to go along with and pretend <coughs> like are meaningful but really are very bad interpretations of things. So de Tocqueville was, was great on foreseeing the new superstition. He spoke of the new despotism which democracies uh, have to worry about. Um, and so you can think of Smith here, I do, of sort of foreshadowing de Tocqueville's awareness of the coming social democratic superstition, okay? This, the coming, as it were, social de democratic serfdom or feudalism, <clears throat> um, kind of replacing go uh, God for a lot of people. And I do think that the politics of the left does, is a kind of surrogate uh, for religion 
uh, in a lot of cases. I'm not saying that you know religion in the sense of you know the origins of the universe or the afterlife, but again, a sort of broad sense of uh, in a Durkheimian sense of associating um, the good of society with religion, with God, with the totem, um, and, and and becoming like a source of meaning and validation. <clears throat> Now there's two things in the part in, that I think support this final parallel that I'm suggesting that the books of casuistry are sort of a parallel to the 10,000 commandments. In this discussion about casuistry, <clears throat> well first of all he talks about like if you're going to think about people enforcing these 10,000 commandments from the government, he says what it's like, he says reserve and concealment this is in the middle of this paragraph. Reserve and concealment call forth diffidence. We are afraid to follow the man who is going we do not know where. I don't know, we're not talking about the politician giving the feel-good speech. We're talking about the actual bureaucrat and enforcers of the 10,000 commandments, right? It's, it's a very frightening, fearful, ugly, coercive affair. And if you contrast that with a voluntary society, I'm not saying like a purely voluntary, but more voluntary affairs where we're not regulated uh, uh, and things are uh, proceeding much more just along the equal, equal relationship, that has a whole different flavor, which I think the rest of this paragraph very importantly describes. Frankness and openness conceal confidence. Look, when we're dealing voluntarily with each other, it pays to be frank and open. If we're not, the other person may not, you know, they, they may abstain from our, 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 our affairs. Frankness and openness conciliate confidence. We trust the man who seems willing to trust us. We see clearly, we think, the road by which he means to conduct us, and we abandon ourselves with pleasure to his guidance and direction. The great pleasure of conversation and society besides arises from a certain correspondence of sentiments and opinions, from a certain harmony of minds which like so many musical instruments coincide and keep time with one another. But this most delightful harmony cannot be obtained unless there is a free communication of sentiments and opinions. In heavily governmentalized affairs there is not this free opinion. Right? That's why real governmental affairs is so humorless. <clears throat> One reason why. The other evidence that there is this parallel is the way the whole book wraps up. Um, so after he's gone through that scheme of the different moralists, he kind of concludes the book. The two useful parts of moral philosophy, therefore, are ethics that's the loose, vague, and indeterminate, aesthetic-like virtues, and jurisprudence, treating especially commutative justice. Casuistry ought to be rejected altogether. And then he goes into a discussion of natural jurisprudence. Um, he calls it a theory of the general principles which ought to run through and be the foundation of the laws of all nations. And at the very end, he announces, I shall in another discourse and endeavor to treat of law and government, <clears throat> not only in what concerns justice, but in what concerns police, revenue, and arms, and whatever else is the object of law. He wrote this and published this in 1759 at the very end of the work. When the book came out again in 1790, and he, after being revised several times, um, he added a preface in 1790 saying, when I announced this, I had every hope and intention of fulfilling it. I have fulfilled the work on police being like policy, revenue, and arms. That's the wealth of nations. I have not fulfilled my announcement with respect to justice. And he never did, unfortunately. Um, we do have the lectures on jurisprudence, two sets of, of, of student notes, um, but they surely are not anything like a substitute for what sort of like a full, fully active 
uh, Adam Smith would have, would have put out. But he says in his preface, even though I have uh, very little hope of completing this, I left this announcement as, as it was. Okay, so we've talked about three moments in Theory of Moral Sentiments of dissembling the true target. Infanticide is the apparent target. I think the real target is the slave tribe. The highwayman, the promise to the highwayman, I think is really about obligations to government and how to regard government. Books of casuistry, I'm suggesting, are about um, 10,000 commandments, okay? Vast governmentalization of social affairs. <clears throat> I think there are very many moments of esoteric writing in Smith. I've just picked out three in this book that follow the dissembling the true target format. Um, and again, I want to echo Condorcet's idea that some people wrote, seeming not to want more than a semi-liberty in politics. Between the lines, as well as explicitly, um, I see so much in Smith that is um, quite staunchly liberal in the original sense of the term, which he had a significant role in establishing. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your attention. Thank you.